For this week's big train tour, we're going to take a look at four different full-sized rail vehicles from the highest railroad operating in North America, the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway. These artifacts of Colorado tourism are preserved and displayed right here at the Colorado Railroad Museum in Golden. Cog railways are unique in that they can traverse very steep grades. The term cog refers to a geared drive wheel which engages teeth mounted on a separate rail between the running rails. The running rails guide the wheels of the locomotives and cars, but the cog does all of the actual pulling. It is also very much a part of the braking system, which is pretty important on a railway line that, in our case, features an average 16% grade with maximum grades of 25%. Hi, I'm Paul Hammond, Executive Director here at the Colorado Railroad Museum. As noted in the summer 2019 edition of our Iron Horse News membership newsletter, three new acquisitions arrived at the museum last year. These three full-size railroad artifacts hailed from the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway, which since 1891 has carried passengers from Manitou Springs, just outside Colorado Springs, up an 8.9 mile long railway line to the 14,110-foot summit of Pikes Peak. This wasn't the world's first mountain cog railway, nor even America's first cog railway. Those accolades belong to the Mount Washington Cog Railway in New Hampshire, which began operations to the top of New England's tallest peak in 1869. But while the Pikes Peak Cog Line was not the first, it immediately achieved the distinction of being the highest railway to operate in North America. Today, the museum preserves not only the line's first steam locomotive, but also its first self-powered internal combustion rail car, believed to be the first of its kind to operate on any cog railway in the world. Also preserved are a power car and a passenger car representing the first generation of diesel-powered train sets developed for the Cog Railway beginning in the late 1930s. But let's get started on our tour and go back to the line's beginnings. Zalman G. Simmons, a New York-born inventor and founder of the Simmons Beauty Rest Mattress Company, started the railway. Simmons was also known for his involvement in the Rock Island Railroad, as well as in telegraphs, the most important communication system in the 19th century. In 1888, Simmons traveled to Colorado Springs to inspect telegraph insulators on Pikes Peak. Legend has it that it took him two miserable days to scale the peak by mule. Apparently moved by the wonderful views from the peak, Simmons decided to finance construction of the Manitou and Pikes Peak Cog Railway. The line, reportedly built by Italian laborers, started construction in 1889 and opened all the way to the summit in 1891. The first trains to operate on this unique railway line were pushed by steam locomotives. Three locomotives were built by Baldwin Locomotive Works in 1890, and this is locomotive number one, the first of the bunch. Originally named John Hulbert, this locomotive was sent back to Baldwin in 1893 for rebuilding into a Vauclane compound configuration. The rebuilding made the locomotive more powerful and efficient, burning less fuel and using less water on each trip. These were both important things. On the Manitou and Pikes Peak line, a steam locomotive needed to start out with a full load of water and then stop an additional two times to take on more water during the uphill trip. Over the years, the railway owned seven steam locomotives, all of them featuring an inclined frame that leveled the boiler so as to keep water distribution more even during operation. One was wrecked in a spectacular runaway in 1896 when a side rod broke. The other six were rebuilt in 1912 with new frames and rod arrangements in the railway's Manitou shops using kits supplied by Baldwin. These engines would burn slightly less than a ton of coal per trip 
with all of it being shoveled by hand. The locomotives worked hard and so did the crews. Each steamer would push a single passenger car uphill ahead of the locomotive. After reaching the summit, the locomotive then served to control the car's downhill descent. No coupler was used. Gravity kept the train connected. Because there was only a single passing track on the line, the number of trains was originally limited each day to just three. This in turn limited the railway's earning potential, which was further eroded by competition first from the Pikes Peak Carriage Road and later the Pikes Peak Auto Highway, which remains in service today as a toll road for automobiles to climb the mountain. The Cog Railway's ownership in 1925 passed to Spencer Penrose. Penrose was owner of the Broadmoor Hotel in Colorado Springs and the financier behind the Pikes Peak Auto Highway. By the time of the ownership change, neither the cog line nor the highway were making much money as they were essentially in competition with each other. Penrose also happened to own, along with his brother, the Midland Terminal Railway, which remained in service from Colorado Springs to Cripple Creek. You may remember that we toured an observation car that once ran on that line in an earlier big train tour. Penrose's purchase of the Cog Railway was significant for at least two reasons. First, the Midland Terminal's former Colorado Midland shops in Colorado Springs would take over repair of the Cog Line's locomotives and rolling stock. Second, within just a few years, the new owners would conclude that the line needed to modernize. This would lead to radically new Cog Rail vehicles within just a few short years. Welcome to rail car number seven, nicknamed the Streamliner. This short, sleek, self-propelled rail car emerged in 1938 from the Midland Terminal's shops as a direct result of management's determination to modernize. It was an immediate success. The line now had a vehicle that could operate economically when patronage was light. Sporting a General Motors 175 horsepower gasoline prime mover initially, the shiny new car was later re-engined with a Cadillac V8 and finally a Cummins diesel. And here's the real kicker. Number seven is believed to be the world's first internal combustion powered cog railway vehicle. That makes this unique car especially significant. Even as pioneering rail car number seven was just demonstrating its utility, management moved forward with bigger plans for modernization. General Electric was commissioned to come up with two unit diesel electric train sets. As with the steam trains that preceded them, the locomotive or power car would always be on the downhill side, pushing the passenger car uphill without the need for a coupler. The first of these new train sets, number eight, was delivered in 1939, just before World War II intervened. Following the war, train sets numbers 9, 10, and 11 were delivered between 1947 and 1950 with some mechanical modifications incorporated to improve their performance. A final train set of the same design, number 12, entered service in 1956. Our representative from this group is locomotive number 9. Let's step aboard diesel electric locomotive number nine and take a look at the controls and the prime mover. The four diesel locomotive car bodies were all fabricated by General Electric. Although General Electric built the diesel locomotives, the matching passenger coaches were fabricated locally by Denver's own Winter Weiss Company, which manufactured truck bodies, trailers, and buses from the 1920s into the 1970s. Notice the windows that wrap up into the ceiling of the car, similar to those found on a dome car. Passengers loved the additional viewing area, although that sun probably got intense at times. Our passenger car, number 12, was the only one of the group to feature tinted upper windows. Notice how the seats tilt in one direction. Again, remember that in service, the line's steep grades would otherwise have passengers almost falling out of their seats. In regular operation, the differently numbered locomotives and cars were paired together randomly. 
basically determined by which ones were available next up from the Cog Railway's car house. Of course, the story of the Cog Railway continues beyond the cars that we've collected here at the museum. By 1964, the railway needed more rail car capacity. For the first time in the line's history, the owners went abroad. In late 1964, the Swiss Locomotive and Machine Works delivered two self-propelled rail cars to Colorado. These Swiss-made cars were so successful and reliable that two more were delivered in 1968. As patronage grew in the 1970s, the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway added two articulated or semi-permanently connected rail cars also built by Swiss Locomotive. The railway also constructed passing routes in several places along the mountainside. Originally, trains could only pass at the Mountain View siding, which allowed just three trains per day to travel up the mountain. With the addition of more passing sidings, the railway could now send up eight trains per day. Another two articulated train sets were added in the 1980s to further expand capacity. With all of this growth, the line's bright red trains and distinctive logo certainly grew to become Colorado railroad icons. Currently, the Manitou and Pikes Peak Railway is closed and undergoing a major rehabilitation, including replacement of all track. It is set to reopen next year in 2021. Although the line's most modern two-unit train sets are being rehabilitated and repowered as part of the project, a number of older locomotives and rolling stock that remained in use through 2017 have all found new homes in museums and other civic settings. An order for three new diesel-electric locomotives and nine new passenger cars has been placed with Stadler Rail. These are once again being constructed in Switzerland, where a number of cog or rack railways still operate today. We're looking forward to the return of rail service to the top of America's mountain very soon. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed our tour of the Colorado Railroad Museum's collection of cog railway locomotives and cars. I also hope that your appreciation for Colorado's rich railroad heritage continues to grow with each and every tour of this museum's collections. If you enjoy our content, like, comment, share, and subscribe. Sharing and commenting in particular may qualify as virtual engagements for important funding programs like the SCFD.